Somebody praise the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to be able to gather in the house of the Lord together? All together? Yeah. Together is the key word. And we pray in unity. That we come together in unity today. Um, praise the Lord. I'm just going to say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today. You are always present when we come together in unity, and you bless that unity. You are present today to heal, present today to deliver, present today to save. And we give you honor and glory, and we bless your name, in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, we want to welcome all of our visitors. We have several visitors with us again this morning, and uh, we just want to welcome you to Bethel. And I'm going to just point out a couple of special visitors. Yesterday, we celebrated our 40th anniversary. We had a party here, and Ron's mother surprised us and came all the way from Woodstock, Ontario, and her, her friend Peggy, <laughs> praise the Lord, her friend Peggy drove her most of the way. She does the driving. Mom did a little bit. But what a blessing and a surprise that was, and they're going to be with us for, for a couple of Sundays. So make sure you get to know Marjorie and Peggy and uh, make yourself known to them. She, she'll remember your name. She's pretty smart. <laughs> anyway, um, please pick up your July calendars, and you'll have uh, you'll know exactly what's coming up in the month of July. But tonight, six o'clock is our Alpha, and so be prepared for that. And we'll come together for a couple of hours on Alpha. That's tonight at six o'clock. Uh, this Tuesday at twelve o'clock is our Seniors Lunch. So yeah. One person's excited about that. One meal she doesn't have to cook. Yeah. <laughs> so if you need more information about that, just, just talk with Dawn at the information desk. And, um, and then just a, a special day that's coming up in July. It is our Alpha Holy Spirit Day, and it's on Saturday, July the 15th. And if you haven't even signed up for Alpha, but what you want to learn more about the Holy Spirit, you are welcome to join us for that day. There'll be two sessions in the morning and two sessions in the afternoon and a barbecue lunch. And so you're welcome to join with us. You could just let Dawn know if you want to sign up for that. But that's on your calendar. Make a note of that, please. And uh, we have a special testimony this morning. Twyla, come on up and share. Oh, this is powerful. God is so good and answers prayer. Dominique's coming up for support here. <clears throat> so, Twyla, tell us what was the issue and the problem. The little girl that we talked about there, actually. And um, she was a year old, and she was in IWK since June the June the 5th, and um, she was having a whole bunch of seizures. She, she, she couldn't keep herself awake. And she came home last Sunday, my WK, and she's doing a wonderful. God can do answers, I can tell you. We've been praying for this little girl. She's doing wonderful. Thank you guys for help and pray for the little one. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. That's what God can do. God answers prayer. So you believe him today. You, you reach out to him today. If you need something or someone you know, you can stand in faith for them. And uh, they'll, be, they'll be healed and saved. We just want to welcome our Filipino family to come and lead our worship this morning. Come on up. 
all the girls. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And Alan. And Alan. Yes. We don't want to call him a girl. <laughs> Lord bless you. If you're able, let's stand and let's worship together. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. We are glad that uh, we can join you today. Amen. And can you say to the person beside you, God is awesome in this place. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 95, verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalm. Amen. So let's do that today. Amen. Praise the Lord.
bless your name, oh God. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for your presence in this place.
Thank you, young people. You're included in the young people, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor and say, good to see you in the house of God.
Well, I trust you got your ears on this morning. And just in case you're wondering, I'm not talking about these things on each side of your head. There is a, a spiritual ear that you'll need to have wide open. Oh, by the way, Oh dear, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, you might say, Pastor Ron, why you got that old thing? Well, my wife was wondering the same thing. <laughs> I put this nicely on the couch along with some other shirts and things that I had, and you know, she, she took the bait. She said, she said, why you got this out? Well, you see, it's kind of ragged. I picked out the best. I mean, it's got tatters and it's got one of these things that are things coming on, raveling. And she's not the nicest looking sweater at all. I, I picked out the worst one I possibly could, you know. And, and, and uh, if you have been around uh, those that have been married or you're married or you would like to be married, just be warned. There'll be somebody that looks at you and probably your spouse will look at you and say, why are you wearing that old thing? In fact, I'll tell you what she did. I had a nice flowered shirt ready to wear this afternoon. I had it laying out with the sweater and you know what she did? This happens after 40 years. <laughs> I'm quite used to it by now. She looks at me up and down. And she said, what do you got this flower thing for? I says, well, I like it. That's the typical man answer. And uh, it is, it is a, a typical thing. I get it. They want you to look good. Well, it's one of my favorites. You know, it's comfortable. It looks great. Well, maybe not today. Well, if the woman raises her eyebrows at you, or she rolls her eyes, my wife doesn't do that very often. She just tells me straight. I just have to take a stroll to the mirror and I'll check it out to see if what she has to say is the truth. Not that I don't believe her. I mean, after all, what's wrong with a little tatter? With a little unraveling? Well, you know what I mean. It's old. I think there's still a lot of life in that old sweater. Don't you think? It still fits, kind of. I tried some, some pants on the other day, and she says, my goodness, you got no hips. <laughs> she looked at me right up and down. My, my wife, you know, if she walks away, she's, she's just kind of signaling, sig signaling that uh, she doesn't agree with what I got. So she might just as well go upstairs and pick out another sweater. Well, you know, she didn't, she didn't, I, I watched her. I watched her to see if she was going to change the sweater. I set her up, you know. Well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what. I put this thing right on this microphone stand and I said to my sister, now you watch and see if Shannon come and takes that thing away. You know, the elbows can be worn out. You know, there could be a, if you can have, you probably have garments that, you know, uh, have some moth holes in them, or maybe a button that's loose or off. That, and you know, I can tell you a story of when you pull a thread, what happens? And there comes a great unraveling. I was supposed to 
to lead worship, and I, uh, when I was putting my pants on, I, I stepped on something. Well, I just gave a little tug. Well, little did I realize that it gave me uh, some holes in my pants. <laughs> and the pants got unraveled, and I sat down, and my wife, she sits down in the congregation, and she's looking, and she comes up and says, close your legs. <laughs> well, my son was young, and he was on the drums back then. So they got me a sweater. It wasn't this one. Got me a sweater and kind of held, held it in front of myself while my son played the drums like he was mar I was marching out. <laughs> Somebody that they thought had pants, he actually lived uh, in the building that we uh, used for a church at that time. It was an old condemned, well, it wasn't condemned, but it was an old uh, uh, convent. And he was living, and they thought, well, go and get him some pants, and we'll try and stitch them up. Well, I'll tell you, I had an unraveling mess, because the only way you could get those things together is the soul. And they brought me a pair of pants that were too small for me. <laughs> I got to tell you something, though. If you pull the wrong string, things come unraveled. But in the same way, many Christians here in the West are watching the unraveling of their faith played out before their eyes. You can still see some of the familiar images and the influence of something that was Christian years ago that our culture once embraced. It was interwoven into the very fabric of our society, but no longer are there our values bright and tight and cohesive. More and more and more, it looks like a patchwork from Frankenstein's closet. Stitched together with something foreign, unmatched, and a material that was never meant to come together. According to all the major studies, the majority, actually they say 70% of young people born in Christian homes think Christianity just isn't the right fit, especially for those who were brought up in a modern naturalistic mindset. So they have abandoned the faith of their parents. For those outside the church, they've probably never seen the church in its heyday. They may have a hard time figuring out why anyone could ever have bought into this stuff in the first place. Over the last couple of generations, Christianity has become more and more uncomfortable for those who wear it. You say, well, why is this happening? Because the church did not pay close attention to the stress the culture placed on it at its foundational level. They begin to attack even Genesis chapter 1. It seems that the entire world view has come apart at its seams. Wow. Well, Pastor, you're sounding like the Christian faith has become just like your old, old ugly sweater. Unraveling away from the teachings of God, the very teaching that believers know and love and are comfortable in. But though to those that are looking on the outside, the church looks outdated, the church looks worn, and a hand-me-down from a bygone era and so forth. 
faith is unraveling. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 to 6, and I'm, I'm sorry, Amber, I, I've got some extra scriptures the Lord gave me this morning I didn't put in the computer. The Lord began to share some things and, well, you know, it is what it is. Not sure how all this will come about. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, God's, the Bible says that he humbled you, talking about God, talking to Israel. He let you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. Their clothes did not get unraveled. It didn't come apart. Praise the Lord. Why? Because Almighty God looked after them. I heard it spoken. He's a present help in time of trouble. All these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines the child, the Lord, your God disciplines you for you, for your own, for your own good. For your own good. So obey the, command, the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his way and fearing him. Now that could be a series. The fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you know Matthew 24, 35 says heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. In other words, his word will never wear out. His word will never wear out. Now turn to your neighbor and tell him that. God's word will never wear out. Glory to God. So the title of my message is The Wearing Out of Faith. Well, for 40 years, God sustained them in the wilderness, Nehemiah 9, 21, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. God looks after you. In fact, he's always been watching you. In fact, he's always listening to you. Christian or non-Christian, he is a listening, seeing God. Oof. Wow. God looks after you. He's always been watching. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, he says, I, I sent Timothy, he's talking to the Thessalonians, I, I sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. Here's why Paul sent him. We sent him to strengthen you. Everyone say word strengthen. He sent to encourage you. Say encourage. To encourage you in what? Encourage you in your faith. And to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you are going through. One translation says the troubles you were, you were going through. But you know, here it is, we are destined for such troubles. You say, Pastor, sign me up. I like trouble. My mom, she asked the Lord for patience and she got me. For a tribulation works patience. Trouble works patience. So she must have had a lot of them. Whew. 
I'm really glad to have my mom here. You will have no idea how much that shocked me. I'll tell you what the reality is. I was shocked all right when I saw my mom. But you would be shocked to realize just how close God is to you every day. Mm-mm. You'd be stunned just like I was stunned, but maybe even greater to realize almighty God is with you. You were destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come and they did. Verse 5 says, That is why I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. Even that little bit lets you know that faith is being tested. Your faith is being tested every day. It was t- it test the Thessalonians. It was tested in Ephesus, in all of the churches. You only have to read the seven books in Revelation or the seven writings to the churches in, in, uh, in the book of Revelation and you'll see. Well, they did come. That's why I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. Paul says, I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you. Can you imagine? The apostle was on shore. He was concerned that these new believers were going to stand the test. You will be tested. You will be tried. Temptations will come. But it's possible to keep faith during the test during the trials. It's possible. The Bible says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand. You plant your feet, you put your teeth together and you say to the devil in Jesus' name, you're not staying here. I've given the illustration before. You have somebody that shows up to your door and with a bag of snakes. You don't know with snakes in it. You see the bag and you see some wiggling things going on. They say, we've got a present for your household. You say, well, what is it? Well, I'm not telling you. There's just some things that are moving here. There's some slimy, slithering things in there, but that's for your household. And you go, well... I'm not taking that in my household. You say, well, it's got your name on it. It's got to come to your house. I'm being paid to deliver it. I don't suggest this on a regular basis. But if they're not going to go, you take a double barrel shotgun and say, get going. You put your foot down. You get out the sword of the Spirit if you have to. And you say in Jesus' name, that thing is not coming into my house. I'm not letting loose a bunch of snakes. You can choose to let them in, by the way. They'll wreak all kinds of havoc in your home. But people do it all the time. They let that bag of snakes in their house. Wow. You say, well, how do you know that it's possible To live by faith all the time. Well, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, it says, It was by faith that Enoch was taken up into heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. Now that's some kind of faith. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. What are you being made known for? Well, I'm a farmer. I'm a welder. I was in a shop the other day. 
And the fellow said to me, my goodness, this is hot. I said, no, this is not hot. He says, where are you from? I says, I can tell you why this is not hot. Because I said, hell is hot, and I'm not there. He said, well, I work in something close to that. He happened to be a welder. I said, well, I can appreciate the heat, but it's nothing like the heat of hell. And I'm not there. This is good compared to that place. But this scripture says that he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who comes to him must believe that God exists and that he is, and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. You want to please God? You want to, does you want, you have a desire to please God? Then you use, you receive and use the faith that he's given you. And you walk in faith. The just shall walk by faith and not by sight. Those hearing ears. Luke chapter 18 verse 8 says, When the Son of Man does return, how many will he find on earth who have faith? What a question. What is your life like? Are you walking in faith? Jesus, one day when he was talk, telling, talking to his disciples, and you know, he's having a conversation with Simon Peter. And Jesus makes a remark to Peter. He says, You know, Simon, 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 Luke 22 31, 31 says, Satan has desire to sift you like wheat. Well, I looked up that word, sift. Siniazzo. Siniazzo. No, that's not from a Star Wars movie. That is a, a Greek word that means to sift, to shake in a sieve, to agitate, to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. Satan has desire to sift you or to overthrow your faith. She's not fun and games. Jesus alone he was alone on land one day and he's on land and the disciples are supposed to get to the other side of the water of the uh, and Jesus saw that the, the boys were it says in Mark 6:48 they were in serious trouble serious trouble He's on shore, and they're on a boat. He's seen they're in serious trouble. I wouldn't be a bit surprised their faith was unraveling. You may be here in this room, or you may be watching online. And you are at a crisis in your faith. You may be spiritually in serious trouble. Who promised to be with us in the trouble? I can see you're all excited about giving the answer. But I know many of you know the answer. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When Jesus was on the cross... And he was hanging there and he goes, Eli, Eli, Elama Sabathani. And our translators have translated like, My God, my God, why has you why have you forsaken me? 
Yet Jesus has already told, on several occasions, Jesus told his disciples, the Father is always with you. He's always with you. He's always with you. And you say, well, I've had people say, well, the reason why Jesus felt uh, abandoned when he was on the cross because he was carrying the weight of people's sin. I've heard that explanation. I, I just haven't seen the scripture to back that up. I just feel that Jesus he was hanging there. He was human. And he's going through such stuff, such agony, and such torment as a human. He goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That may very well be the feeling that some of you have in this room. Why have you forsaken me? What? You've left me in this mess. Come on, if you're God, you ought to be here. And our soul cries out with it us. God hadn't left him. You just have to read the rest of the story to realize. They were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind, and Jesus came out toward them, walking on the water. The very thing that they were troubled at, Jesus was walking on. The very thing you're troubled with, Jesus is walking on. Because trouble, he's master over it. He has not succumbed to the trouble. To the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus, in talking to Ephesus, the writer says in Writing right from the words of God, you have persevered in patience. You've labored for my sake, God says, and have not become weary. Tells that, speaks that to the church at Ephesus. But he said, the only problem I have is that you have left your first love. You weren't quite as passionate as before. You, 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 you are, 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 you haven't become weary, but just left some things undone. When you're going through trouble, and when you're trying to roll the boat on your own, you're going to become weary that you forget to look up unto the hills from whence cometh your help. There are some that may not have the understanding of how the foundations of faith are so important and they're not grounded. And when stuff happens, they, faith gets washed away. We haven't yet been we haven't yet got to that part where we are waiting for the restoration of all things to be, made, to be made good once again. In between the creation and the cross was the most devastating event that has ever occur, occurred on this planet. And that was the fall of man. Adam rebelled against God. And he caused a condemnation and a sin over the entire creation. Adam had been given dominion over everything. And his sin resulted that another Adam, which the Bible talks about Jesus, had to come and willingly die on the cross and pay the penalty for sin. Because that sin could not be left undone. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin Christ paid for by his death. Those in Christ are saved 
When you come to Christ, you must believe that he is. And you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And when you are saved, you are born from spiritual death to life. Praise the Lord. And then there is a day when we're going to be, uh, we're going to receive an incorruptible form. I don't know what that looks like. I do know that one day we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. I can see they're all excited. Glory to God. They're just jumping in their pews. I don't know. I know the excitement that you have about Jesus coming. But you see, what we don't realize, that in the meantime, there is an unraveling. The church has has been unraveling even in the early 1800s. They begin to bring in this uh, stuff about the millions of years, how the earth is supposed to be millions of years versus a, a biblical view of about 6,000 years. They, in, they attempted to insert a patch into our belief. They begin to stitch their thoughts and reasonings of what the world is offering on authority. And, and, and it wasn't looking at it. It was trying to get our view off of the word of God. The church largely has ignored the problem. The church are still trying to fit with the old garment that's unraveling. We're trying to do it on our own strength. With our own ability. The world misses the fact that God's word is interconnected, it's interwoven, and it's dependent on itself. It's cohesive. It makes sense. I'm not going to go into the fossils, the record of the fossils. So the fossils show that there was death and suffering. But what they fail to see that in the world's view is that they don't see a need for Jesus. How can a Christian answer why answer why the question why there is there so much pain and suffering in the world if God is good? And how, why is there things like disease, like cancer? Well, if the earth is millions of years old, then there's got to be pain and suffering in that. And if it's millions of years old before God created the heavens and the earth, when it comes time to the restoration of all things, wouldn't it be just like, if it's being restored, wouldn't it be just like the former? You wouldn't need Jesus. The church didn't see the questions that were being asked as eroding away our Bible. We did not respond we did not cry out on the behalf of babies that have been aborted. We have not cried out against euthanasia or any other hot topic button. I've responded by letters and signing petitions and chatted with our political le uh, leaders, but I have not addressed these things in our congregation. I can't point the finger at others of my clergy fellow believers. May, just maybe we shouldn't be trying to put on the same old garments and sweaters that we've used in the past. I know it was preached when I was young. Don't get involved in politics. They're all liars. Well, I think what happens, what needs to happen is we need an extreme makeover in the way we approach our beliefs about the word of God. Creation just isn't an accessory to the gospel. The doctrine of creation and the fall of man and redemption stand absolutely with an historical place that cannot fall apart, even with all our playing games with Genesis. Are we tired of being perceived as outdated and ir uh, irrelevant? Are we okay with being largely ignored, dismissed, do you have trouble with the fashionable questions and objections being raised against the word of God? 
The system of this world is trying desperately to make the Bible a document look like it's dividing the world and propagates violence. Our Christian values face an unprecedented threat. The United Nations has just heard a report claiming that our cherished beliefs in the Bible violate the rights of special interest groups. In Daniel chapter 7, there were ten horns. It begins with verse 20. There were ten horns and on its head another horn that came up before three, three fell. That horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Daniel says, I was watching and that same horn was making war against the saints. You talk about the wearing down of faith. Do you realize there is an all-out war against being a Christian. I cannot tell you in plainer words. Making war against the saints. And the Bible says, and prevailing. Daniel 7, 20, 22. Making war against the saints and prevailing in other words, wearing them down. Oh man, you say, Pastor Ron, I come to church to hear about the wearing down of the saints. Well, there's good news. Hallelujah. 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 Because in verse 22, it says, Until the Ancient of Days comes... And a judgment was made in favor of the saints. Glory to God. In favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. In the meantime, the devil's out to wear you out. But you stand firm in faith. Daniel goes on to say that the saints will, will be given into his hand for a time. The devil's time is numbered. We serve the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. When the world says we're scum, we're backward in the dark ages, we're not progressive in our thinking, it's time that believers shed the old sweaters. We need to get out of our comfort zones and learn how to better share our faith and give a defense for the gospel. Glory to God. And, you know, we're not going to be continue to be perceived as tired and outdated by the culture that has seen Christians who have compromised for decades. They have been silent. We don't want to stand out. We want to be liked. We don't want to be perceived as unloving and misguided, you know. But the Bible isn't patchwork of half-truths. It's not cobbled together from a primitive culture that some say there's no science there. But the Bible is the revealed word of the master designer. And you can trust him. In Genesis chapter 1, God was speaking. And when he spoke, things happened. In John 1, it says, in the beginning, verse 1, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. He created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. 
The Word gave life to everything that was created. And His life brought life to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish it. The best they can do is shut us down. That's all they've got. They can get angry. They can act like we don't exist. And well, no wonder they've been trying not to believe in the existence of God. They have a surprise coming. Genesis 2 takes us into a small part of the world where the Lord creates the heavens and the earth. And then on the earth, he makes a garden. And in this garden of Eden, he puts his image bearers in it. And he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. Now this is a rather unique setting, you know. When we get these conditions of Eden described in Genesis 2, it's reflected on in later in Scripture when we realize that in Genesis 2, just after Genesis 2, there's Genesis 3. And where do you say, where does that leave us? We are in the Genesis 3. We are outside of Eden. We're being put on the outside. And when you are living in the outside, it's really hard to see any kind of the garden story. We were all born outside of Eden. And when you're born outside of Eden, it's really hard to see Revelation when you're blind. This is the side of Eden that people want their religion to be easy to digest. We don't like suffering. We don't like unraveling. But my friends, human suffering is the constant theme in the Bible. It's so prevalent throughout. You have the history of the Jews. The Jews is a story of suffering. You got Job. It's devoted entirely, entirely to suffering. But let me tell you about Job. You know that Job's trial was only nine months long? We look at that book like, oh, look at Job. You know, I'm just going through just like Job. Oh, I'm sorry, you're going through just like Job. But Job is the story of man's redemption. We look at the suffering and we don't see the redemption. We look at the story of the Jews. It's the story of redemption. It's the same story we have. We have the same story. We've been bought with a price. Suffering is not the end of the story. When, when comforting the Lord's people, Peter, uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, he said, for you have been called for this purpose. What purpose is that, you ask? Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example for you to follow in his steps. We think we're going to get transported out of this thing, out of our trouble. That we're not going to have to face anything. I got news for you. Jesus did not commit any sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. He didn't return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus himself bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. In this world, there is bound to be some unraveling. Everything that can be unraveled will be unraveled. But we are to emulate Jesus Christ. One of the reasons Jesus has allowed suffering in the world is to provide us with an opportunity to be patterns to follow after. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. For who, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What? For 
where there was joy on the other side of his obedience, and he endured it. And while you don't like the trouble you're going in, you fix your eyes on Jesus. It's going to come. Tribulations are going to come if we're going to enter the kingdom of God. I'll tell you. In Acts chapter 14, it says that they strengthen the believers. They encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. This is not a walk in the park. Before Jesus left this earth, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. Trouble and test will come. You might as well expect it. It will come in unexpected ways. It'll come whether you're tired or whether you're weak. And many won't even recognize that, that it's upon them. They'll just complain. And some of the Lord's best will even deny that it exists. If this thing is left untreated and unaddressed, the conflict and opposition and suffering will wound even the best of us severely. But if treated and promptly, the suffering will honor Christ, strengthen the faithful, and stun the enemy, and impress the watching world. You say, come on, pastor, the world's not watching us. Oh, yes, they are. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in, very, in, in times of trouble, a very present help, King James says. We will not fear when earthquakes come, when mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. There is a river that brings joy in the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdom crumbling. But God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's army is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. We've got resources. We've got resources to call. You, and you, you may go through this thing and you may not feel the presence of God, or you may. But we ought to be able to, to serve the Lord strongly, regardless of whether we feel His presence or not. You say, why? Because the world is watching. If you read the story in Acts chapter 16, at midnight Paul and Silas were wounded, their backs were all bloody, they were locked in stocks in a Philippian jail. And what did they begin to do? Oh, they begin to sing and they begin to pray. And the prisoners, it says, was listening. They're always watching. They're always uh, listening. Wow. Acts 6 says that they were watching. Watching the reactions of the believers. Taking note, greatly impressed and wanted to be a part of the believers because they were experiencing something they weren't. When, Jerusalem, when the Jerusalem congregation was threatened by conflict, disciples said to the congregation, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. What did they do? They served, they, they stayed the course. Handling suffering or the test is the DNA of every believer. And I'm just going to say this. The one thing that does. That God does not expect or appreciate. Is when believers are belly aching. About the suffering they're enduring. The one prayer that should. Should not. Expect to be answered is. Why me Lord? Do we think we're special? Do we think we're better than all the preceding generations that have gone before? Well, not all of the suffering that goes on is sanctified or redemptive. Some of it's needless and shameful and pointless. However, 
There is a verse in Philippians that talks about the fellowship of his suffering. Those times we may count on his nearness and heaven's resources and God's purposes, but we, when we suffer for our faith, we share in the fellowship of his suffering. And God will not waste any kind of suffering. When we emerge on the other side of the storm, we realize we've been changed. We are stronger. So I would say to you, don't let your faith be unraveled. Don't let your faith be shaken. No one volunteers to get hurt. But when it comes, just offer it to the Lord. Let him help you. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Huh. When the early Christians were uh, beaten up a little bit, they went away from the council and the Bible says that Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer the shame for his name. James says, count it all joy when you encounter various kinds of trials. The world will always consider this kind of suffering, the fatal flaw, the Achilles heel of the Christian faith. They call it pointless. But we do not let that unsettle us. Look, as with everything else about the kingdom of God, the world doesn't get it. So, we minister to you this message to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you are going through. Search me, O God, David says. And know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and leads me along the path of everlasting life. I have one more scripture before I close. And what I would like you to do I believe that speaking in tongues is something that happens when we are filled with the Spirit. There's an interesting verse in Jude, the book of Jude, that says, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What that does is that keeps you in the love of God. Glory to God. Now, I know that, and I know that there are people, there are some that do not, they could be watching, they don't believe in speaking in tongues. I, I, uh, I'm sorry if there has been a, something that has offended you. You might be here in this congregation and you don't speak in tongues. We do not condemn you. But I am going to invite those of you that are filled with the Spirit to begin to speak in your heavenly language. And I'll tell you what, you'll say, well, the person next to me, they're not. Well, they can catch it. Some of you just need to be built up in the most holy faith. You're going through stuff, such heavy stuff that you need to be built up in the Spirit. You say, Pastor, I, I, I just need prayer. I, I just need prayer. I, I don't know about this language stuff. I just need prayer. You just come to the front here somewhere and find a place and somebody will come in and, and pray with you. You're going through such stuff. Your faith has come becoming unraveled. You've been pressured in all this. Come on now. Pray with me in the Spirit. 
and allow God to minister to you to build yourself up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Spirit and allow the Spirit of God to minister to somebody else that has a need in their body, has a need in their life. How to commente the abasho kola masonto mande di abasho de. Lamdri abasho di abasho to mande. Kamburasho kola masoti abasho de. Antori abasho kola mande kipende di abasho kola de. Hali abasho di abasonto abasho kini. Tonto abasho kola masonti abasho ti abasho kola. He can not abasho the abasonti abasho ti. Kinda abasho the abasonto abasho tolma. Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy here. Come to your abasho to the abasonto the abasho ti. Hallelujah, abasho to the abasonti abasho. He can not the abasho to the abasonti abasho ti. He can not abasho to the abasonti Indeed, Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to Him to have their sin removed. Isn't the name of Jesus?
so weak.
just before we close, I would like the worship team to come up and do the second song you did. If you can do that, I would like you to sing that again, and then we will just close in a word of prayer. If you still need prayer while they're singing, you can come up and we'll minister to you in Jesus' name.
now we come to you in Jesus name I pray for those that have their garments are becoming unraveled and I ask in Jesus name that you will place upon them a new garment of hope they will find themselves in, captivated by your rest in the name of Jesus I'm not asking you to mend the old garments. I am asking you to give them new garments in the name of Jesus. We love you, Father. I ask that you'd bless your people and they're going out, they're coming in and they're rising up and they're sitting down. And let your peace that surpasses all understanding will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Give them that period of rest from those that assault them. In Jesus' name. And we thank you and give you praise. Now, just because we've said the final prayer, you are free to go. If you still want to come and just sit in the presence of God and, and pray around, you, you feel free. You can sing it, sing it again. 